If the situation called for still more protection, he simply grew spears which projected from his body armor. All right, we're live. Welcome everybody to Paleontologizing. I'm here at the Carter County Museum in Ekalaka, Montana for the ninth annual Dino Shindig. This is really like the event of the year here in Ekalaka. And uh, there's all kinds of paleontologists and you know undergraduates and volunteers and all kinds of cool people here. And uh, before things get really crowded, I'm gonna take you on a quick tour of the museum. And uh, we'll look at some of the really cool, really unique displays. This is honestly one of my very favorite museums in the entire world, and I'll show you why. Uh, why I love it so much. But, uh, yeah, I'm just doing a quick, uh, like a video broadcast. Yeah, yeah. I won't get you in the, on camera or anything. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, here, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's go ahead and uh, go check out some of the displays. We've got some history stuff over here. We might check that out later, but our priority for right now, obviously, is paleontology. This is honestly one of the best dinosaur museums in the whole state of Montana, and uh, I'll show you why. Here is the fossil hall, yeah. and uh, right here greeting you as you enter is a cast of Y-Rex. This is a Tyrannosaurus specimen from just south of here down in Wyoming, if I remember correctly. I think it's, that's why it's got the name Y-Rex. Um, yeah. And let's see. Quality is 5 out of 5. Thank you there. That's great feedback, Claire. Um, and hey, Mayor Space, I need Rion. Diagonal, Lordy, how are you doing? Uh, Dino Mama UK, I hope you're doing well. It's good to see you. Anyway, check this out. This is... Moment where it was kind of heartbreaking. I'm no. destroying... Never. No, we're, glue is cheap. Two months woo. Okay. I'm some difficulty with this. This is a live streaming rig, actually. Yeah, I'm doing a live stream right now, but it signal is not working properly for me. Yeah. Well, it's a big part of it, yeah. But I've got like you know four different wireless modems, and I'm running off the Wi-Fi too, so it should be working. Yeah, that's all. But yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. That's that might help actually. Yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, it looks like I'm back on. All right. Thank you, Lordy. Can you guys see me right now? I was just about to show you a really cool pose on this Tyrannosaurus skeleton mount. Um, so, I'm going to walk toward the front and show you there. But there is that pubic boot contacting the ground right there. I was talking about how these guys and gals would sit uh, on that. That would actually rest on the ground and help them support their body weight. Uh, well, check that out. So yeah, these are the pubic bones right here, and they've got that big heel on the bottom. We call it the pubic boot. There's the ischium sticking out of the back, um, and then those are the ilia up there. So this gives you some sense of scale, I guess, uh, for how big this animal is. This is not the largest Tyrannosaurus skeleton we have anywhere in the world, but it's still pretty big. And check out those arms right there. Yeah. Looks like it's about to pounce, says Izzy. <laughs> yeah, so look at how small these arms are. And it's got that little splint right there of uh, digit three. Pretty cool. And look at the radius and ulna and how small those are. Those are significantly smaller than my radius and ulna. And I'm not a particularly big guy. The humerus is a little bit smaller than mine probably, but more robust. And I'm sure it didn't come with the cast, but 
it'd be awesome to have the furcula right there, the wishbone in between the uh, the coracoids, but they don't have it on this one. We're gonna have to go to Museum of the Rockies to see a furcula, a wishbone on a T-Rex. Uh, I'm excited to show that to you when we go see Pex Rex at Museum of the Rockies next week. Check out these cervical ribs right now. Very cool. These ones are kind of wonky, kind of askew. But, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember the... What was it? Um, the, like, homology of cervical ribs. I think these are actually... I think they're ossified tendons that basically turn into, like, ribs over the course of the animal's life. I could definitely be wrong about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and hedgehog legs. Hey, thank you for the subscription. I really appreciate that. Welcome to paleontologizing. Yeah, I'm going to go over here for just a second. Um, how can you hear me right now? Do I need to talk a little louder or is this good? I hope with the mic right here I can talk at this volume and be unobtrusive in the museum, not be annoying or anything. And uh, But you can still hear me. That's the hope. Audio is good? Thanks, family and cheese. Good to know. Um, Izzy says, how accurate is the T-Rex there? It's just about as accurate as it gets, Izzy, yeah. I mean, this is this is a cast of an original Tyrannosaurus specimen. Like, so these are all exact I can't go over there. Maybe I can just kind of show you from here. But if I walk over in that direction, I think it'll cut out again. But I think Nate put this together. Beautiful as dark head and neck. The uh, drinking fountain there gives you some sense of scale. But there's a cervical vert with the neck vertebrae uh, from here in Carter County. Um, Finally, oh, I've been working on this since uh, 9 a.m. It's, uh, it's up and running. Nice. Yeah. Man, I had to switch to the big guns for this with the signal booster, but uh, yeah. Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. <laughs> Chili Foxy, Cyborg Chop, how are you doing? Lordy, thank you for all of your encouragement during this. I really appreciate it. I am in the uh, behind the scenes area of the Carter County Museum right now. It's a place I spent a lot of time in the past. Back in 2012 and then 2013, I did a lot of work here during the summer. And uh, really excited to show you some of the exhibit stuff. I don't know how far I can go through there without the signal cutting out. But thankfully, I've resolved some of the issues with the equipment now. It turns out that the, uh, the power cord or the uh, HDMI cable to the camera has to be pulled out ever so slightly. Yeah, go for it. Um, you can't have it plugged in properly. It's got to be just kind of dangling there really precariously for the signal to go through for whatever reason. So I can consistently get the camera to work now. And I finally got the Wi-Fi to cooperate. It is such a buggy interface. Live, you should really do something about improving that because it is uh, <laughs> it's kind of garbage. Um, incredibly frustrating. And there's no way to... To, uh, to do it remotely if you don't have uh, any cell service. So I was finally able to get the uh, signal booster all fired up and that gave me just enough bandwidth to be able to get into the web portal and then change some things around and here we are, by the, by the skin of our teeth. So uh, 
Yeah. Anyway, everybody, should we uh, go explore some of the exhibits? Let's go take a look. You know, actually, before we do that, let me show you a couple of cool things in here. Hopefully, this is uh, this is all cool with Nate. But uh, I wanted to show you this really quick. Does anybody know what this is? <laughs> uh, not an ostrich egg, no, Dr. Javasaurus. This is a globe from the late Cretaceous. So this would be just about, probably about 70 million years ago. Maybe, actually maybe closer to 66 though, maybe closer to the KPG boundary. This is what North America looked like at the time. A big seaway running through. This is a like custom made globe. I'm, I gotta ask Nate about it, but I'm pretty sure Nathan Carroll built this himself. It might be the only one of its kind in the world. And you get to see it right now. Uh, pretty cool. This is after that land bridge uh, disappeared again, North America and Asia were once again separated. Um, pretty cool stuff. But uh, isn't that cool, Anita? Yeah, absolutely. There's a million really cool things like that here in this museum. And I'm really excited to show you. I'm going to ever so cautiously make my way into there, hopefully not get out of the range of the Wi-Fi. But hopefully this bad boy, this antenna here with the uh, signal booster on the back should give us just enough bandwidth to be able to make this work. But we'll see. All right, so behold, the Carter County Museum. Trying to hit anything with the antenna. <laughs> you still see me? Um, let me know. Yeah. Does anybody see this right here? This is as dark in pterosaur skeleton. Very, very cool. This is a sculpt. So, uh, but a pretty well done sculpt, I would say. Uh, this is life size for some of the, well, as dark it's get a lot bigger than this, but uh, it's certainly taller than me. Um, yeah, <laughs> reborn like a phoenix. I know, right? It's working, it's working. Uh, you know, I only had to wrestle with this for, let's see, from nine o'clock until, Three o'clock? Only six hours, you know. I'm gonna venture a little bit further this way. And, uh, oh, this is super cool. Maybe I'll save this for in a minute when uh, we've got more people watching. But this is not a replica. This is an actual fossil right here. And you see those white arrow marks on there. Uh, that, those are pointing to bite marks, it seems from a Tyrannosaurus. This is a denary from a Triceratops, this is the, uh, the lower jawbone. And you can see, do you see those scour marks on there? You do not find those on a typical Triceratops denary. This has been chewed on by a T-Rex. Um, pretty cool that we have, you know, evidence of, uh, of behavior feeding in a specimen like that. Super cool. Um, uh, something was chomping on that for sure. Exactly, Java Source. And the thing is, we can actually look at the spacing between those, those different gouges, and we can tell it doesn't look like a crocodile, it doesn't look like uh, a dromaeosaur or a troodontid. There's pretty much only one big carnivorous animal in this environment that could have done that. And that's this guy over here. Let me show you. All right, fingers crossed that the signal holds. But, uh, yeah, and Dr. Java sources, there's literally close to no flesh there. That's the thing, these animals were incredibly thorough when they were feeding. But, this is why, right? So, this is a, uh, a cast of a Tyrannosaurus specimen from Fallon County here in Montana. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, here. And as far as I know, this is the only prone Tyrannosaurus skeleton mounted anywhere in the world. Um, so the curator here, Nate Carroll, was able to get hold of this, this cast, have it donated to the museum. And uh, 
The ceilings in this facility are too low to have this animal standing up at full height. So I just decided to put it sitting down on the ground like it would be if it's just waking up from a nap or something like that. So you see we've got the four limbs right there, kind of resting on the ground. These are, just to give you some sense of scale, not all that large. Tyrannosaurus famously, famously has really short arms, only two digits. And this one actually has the, the remnant of digit three, which is pretty cool. I don't know if this is represented in the original specimen. In fact, that looks like a sculpt right there. But yeah, pretty cool. Only two of the digits would have been visible in life. This one almost certainly would have been enclosed by flesh. You've got those two claws right there. Not very big. Um, yeah, Java sources have never seen one of them lying down. Isn't that cool? But this is most likely, you know, how they slept. Uh, so I don't know if you could see this earlier when we were going over it um, this morning, right after nine o'clock. But uh, we've talked a little bit about the pelvis of Tyrannosaurus. You know, it's got this big old pubic boot on the, uh, like, protruding off of its pubic bone, kind of like the keel of a boat or something like that. And that is right down here. I was telling you guys a while ago about how uh, I think that when Tyrannosaurus would be sitting down, they do it kind of like a chicken does, kind of folding its legs underneath its body and then using that big pubic boot to help support all of its weight. Look at that right there. Those are hip bones down there contacting the ground. Really, really robust. This is one of the, one of the kind of identifying characteristics of Tyrannosauroids. Or uh, it might even it might just be derived Tyrannosaurus. I'm not sure if guys like Guan Long or Dai Long have this, but anyway, yeah, that big old pubic boot. Pretty cool, right? Huh? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, pretty neat. Yeah, let me uh, give you a different view right here. <laughs> pretty awesome. Uh, again, for anybody who is new here. Welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And right now, I'm here at the Carter County Museum in Ekalaka, Montana, looking at some of the uh, public displays. This is the kind of thing that I do here on Twitch nowadays. I've been doing science outreach for, you know, well over a year now. Um, it's been going really well, and I've kind of gotten started with uh, IRL mobile live streaming more recently. And, uh, as you can see, it's taken me to uh, some pretty cool places. Yeah. Pretty cool. And yeah, again, this is Y-Rex. I thought maybe it was named such... This is the nickname for the specimen. It is Tyrannosaurus rex. That is this taxon. That's this animal. But a lot of them get nicknames, the specimens. This one's called Y-Rex because this guy, Don Wyrick, Montana rancher, um... He, uh, I guess, owned the land that this was found on, or maybe he discovered it. I don't know the full story there, but it's named after him. So, uh, pretty cool. Take a look at this. That femur right there. <laughs> the biggest bone in this animal's body. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Biggest bone in terms of length. Probably mass, too. Although, uh, well, I don't know. The pubis might actually be the femur. Come to think of it. And the ilium might be too. It's funny, I've never actually been this close to you know, Tyrannosaur pelvis. Right. Full-grown T-Rex pelvis, I should say. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, speaking of Tyrannosaurus, <laughs> does anybody recognize this right here? Long-time viewers will probably be familiar with this uh, this little specimen. Um, anybody in chat now? Uh, who is it, Javasaurus? Do you know? <laughs> We've seen this guy many, many times. I think it might even be in the channel trailer for this channel. But uh, it's so cool that, that Nate put this on display. This is the same juvenile Tyrannosaurus 3D print 
that I have in my office back at home in Oakland. Uh, this is based in part on Chomper Rex, Museum of the Rockies specimen MOR 6025 or 6022 or something. But uh, that's the world's youngest and smallest T-Rex. And I helped dig that up back in 2013 and 2014 with Denver Fowler's crew. Uh, anyway, speaking of Tyrannosaurus ontogeny, we have a wonderful display right here. This is really cool. This is really, really cool. Um, so I know we talk a lot about dinosaur ontogeny on this channel. Um, that's kind of a constant soapbox of mine. So it's really cool to see this in a public display. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we've got a few different specimens. I've heard a lot about this one, the Jordan Theropod at LACM, Los Angeles County Museum. But as you can see, when Tyrannosaurus were young, their skulls look a lot different from the adults. Far less robust, far more kind of narrow and svelte. And then... The Cleveland skull. Is this, uh, is this Jane? No, that's Jane, right there. <laughs> this is the Cleveland skull. This was the, uh, the holotype of, well, first it was called uh, Gorgosaurus lancensis, and then it was re-described as Nanotyrannus lancensis, and now we realize it's just a juvenile Tyrannosaurus. Um, and I love that image there from, uh, Ray Troll's art, uh, an image from Cruising the Fossil Freeway. I remember that picture. That's a great book. If uh, if you like this channel, I think you'll probably really like that book too. You should check out Cruising the Fossil Freeway by Kirk Johnson and uh, Ray Troll. Um, yeah, and here we have Jane. This is from the Burpee Museum in Illinois. This, of course, obviously is a cast right here. All of these specimens are cast. And... Uh, yeah, pretty neat. So this display talks about Tyrannosaurus histology and ontogeny. Um, there's been a controversy for a good while now as to whether Nanotyrannus is actually a distinct genus of uh, Tyrannosaur or if it's just a juvenile Tyrannosaurus. Well, the general consensus nowadays that's forming is that it is indeed a juvenile Tyrannosaurus. Um, but yeah. I don't know, that could all change though. If somebody ends up finding an adult nano tyrannus that is skeletally mature, you could overturn that with just one discovery. Yeah. I wouldn't bet on it though. <laughs> oh, and take a look at this. <laughs> oh, I am very familiar with these elements right here. <laughs> oh, does anybody recognize these? Does anybody recognize this perspective? That is the same 3D printer that I have at home, and it's printing one of the same specimens that I have. The full-size full uh, juvenile Tyrannosaurus skeleton. The one that um, uh, Justin Van Luke put together, that Belgian artist. So, yeah. Something tells me that in a few months here, Carter County Museum might also have that same specimen mounted. Which would be really cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, cool, Juan Pacanapu. You were at a museum that had teenage T-Rex next to a cast of Sioux. Very cool, very cool. I think dinosaur ontogeny is one of those things that it's so important. And I don't know, it's kind of a new frontier in terms of dinosaur science. Uh, and even a lot of paleontologists are still starting, some of them are just beginning to realize how important ontogeny is. I mean, if you don't understand how these animals grow and mature, you really don't understand them as animals. And you'll probably get their taxonomy all messed up, and get their functional morphology, like everything about them. None of this stuff makes sense, really, except in the light of ontogeny. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, behind you is this fossil bed. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, there's a really cool feature of the local geology called Medicine Rocks here in Carter County, just outside of Ekalaka. Um, so this talks about that a little bit. Um, I might be visiting there on the way out. I've got to see if cell service is, if I get Verizon out there. If I don't, then I won't be able to live stream it. But it'd be kind of cool to do. Um, 
Yeah, I love the the way that these displays are worded. It's just, uh, I don't know. I've done a lot of thinking about this sort of thing because I've done some museum work before and I've done some exhibit, you know, work and writing and that kind of thing. And I think a lot of museum placards, you know. Uh, if they are written by experts, sometimes there's a lot of information in there, but it's not necessarily written in a super engaging way, or in a way that's really easy for, uh, in a way that kind of captures your attention. It might be chock full of data and information and interpretations, but there isn't necessarily a whole lot there to kind of, you know, maintain the attention of regular people reading it. These displays are not like this. Um, these displays are. Uh, the placards here, they're written in a really, really thoughtful way. And I like that a lot. Um, let me see if I can find an example of this. Um, uh -huh. well, I forget, there was one over here. But these are all local fossils here. Very cool. Um, oh, we were talking about... <laughs> About some of our uh, our ancestors during the Cretaceous and during the Paleocene, and uh, this is almost like a family portrait right here. Uh, Homo sapiens and his great 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 million times great grandmother. Um, some of our earliest primate ancestors would look a lot like that little critter right there. Uh, Pretty neat, I think. Like little squirrel-like animals. The first of the primates. The first ones that we have from, uh, what is that, probably Puerkin age? Uh, would it be like Fort Union Formation or something like that? They would have looked a lot like this. Kind of like a weird little squirrel. Uh, pretty neat. Yeah. Of course, I'm here during the annual Dino Shindig. This is the ninth annual one. Started back in 2012, I guess. I went to the one in 2013. Um, and I actually helped set up for that. That's when it was still pretty new. I ended up staying up until like 3 or 4 a.m. Just putting like, you know, last minute touches on stuff. It was not like that this year. They've got this down to a science almost. It's pretty impressive. Um, but yeah, this is talking. It's cool that... I guess when the shindig is not taking place, they have some displays about it, which is pretty cool. Um, oh, and I really like this. So I'm pretty certain, not 100% sure, but I'm pretty certain that that is an original skeletal drawing by Nate Carroll. I think I remember him working on that at some point. Um, and this one is too, this uh, notosaur here. But this is one of those things that you're not going to see at any other museum. This is not clip art or something like that. This is something that's unique to this institution. Like this is some kind of local flavor, which I think is really cool. Um, let's see. Oop, that says disconnected. I hope that's... Yeah, it should be okay. Um... Are we still connected right now? Let me know. Uh, someone really liked the 3D printer. What do you mean, Java Space? We're still live? Okay, great. Great. Okay. Um, but here, we've got a neat display on Thyreophoran dinosaurs. These are the armored dinosaurs, which include the Stegosaurs and the Ankylosaurs, both with and without tail clubs. And this is a cast of one of the latter. Uh, Edmontonia. Again, there's that skeletal drawing right there. Um, but yeah, and this is cool. Uh, so cast, the skull right here is a cast, obviously. I could have told you that. And the bone, those osteoderms there in blue, are right here. Take a look at that. And these are from right here in Carter County. Pretty neat. So I don't know, the texture of these ankylosaur osteoderms is really, really distinctive. I've come across some of these in the field, usually smaller than this. These are pretty impressive ones, at least compared to what I found in the Hell Creek. But uh, 
they've got this really distinctive texture. Kind of reminds me of. I remember John Scanella always used to say that it reminds him of cornbread. Can you see that? I don't know. What do you think it looks like? <laughs> um, and Javasaurus, yes, Scutellosaurus is related to Ankylosaurus. We were talking about Scutellosaurus a little bit yesterday at the museum in uh, Rapid City. And uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Scutellosaurus is one of the ancestors of those later Thyreophorans. It's also a lot smaller. And it's also bipedal or maybe facultatively bipedal. We were talking about how um, bipedality is kind of a basal characteristic for a lot of dinosaur groups. It's so like a lot of new dinosaur groups when they first arrive, they start off bipedal, walking on two legs. And then later, they develop quadrupedality as they get kind of larger and more massive. Um, yeah, yeah. So bipedality is kind of a primitive, primitive characteristic, to use a loaded word, for dinosaurs. But pretty neat. Yeah. Um, so ankylosaurs, really, really cool. <laughs> this is the display that I was thinking of when I was talking about how a lot of the displays here and the placards are written in a very informative but unpretentious, very accessible kind of way. This is this is the example that I had in mind. Uh, mind of the tail. One thing Thyreophorans take pride in are their tails. Stegosaurus from the Jurassic period had two ribs of bony scutes uh, in the shape of triangular plates running, lining their backs and tails. The animal also had four large spikes on the end of the tail termed the Thagomizer after the late Thag Simmons and Gary Larson. So yeah, and there of course, we've talked about this I don't know how many times on this channel, but it's really cool to see this in a museum display. Um, it's really neat stuff. Uh, yeah, I like this place a lot. And uh, let's see, I'll take you over here and show you a few of these things real quick. Of course, this is, I think the Carter County Museum is the, I want to say it's one of the oldest museums in the entire state of Montana. And uh, so it's got a pretty long history. And it's got some of these like legacy displays they really can't get rid of. <laughs> Um, because they've been here for decades and decades and decades. And given that this museum is kind of a cornerstone of the town, uh, this is like one of the, this is really maybe the biggest attraction for the area. There's a lot of people in this town that have a lot of emotional attachment to some of these uh, older displays, even if they are not quite as... Uh, no, uh, they're, they're pretty out of date, but they have a certain charm to them, so I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, yeah, yeah, and of course, in uh, typical like you know museum of science fashion, we use this as a teaching opportunity in order to talk about how our views of dinosaurs has changed. When you look at dinosaurs, it's come a long way since their initial discovery. This is a nice way to, uh, I don't know, still incorporate old things into the museum. Old displays like this. Um, while talking about new information. Really cool. Yeah. And Claire says, you look so stoked, Danny. Claire, I'm just so... I'm elated that this thing is finally working. I was working on this for six hours, troubleshooting it, trying to get it up and running, and now it is. So... I seem excited. That's that's part of the reason why. Also, these displays are just really, really cool. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and fossil vet, yeah, you are right. Um, I would like to emphasize a little bit just how different this is from uh, the museum that I went to yesterday. I mean, it that certainly had its charms. The the dinosaur museum in Rapid City, but it's really more of an it's a little more of an entertainment venue than it is like, you know, a museum that you'll really learn a whole lot at or really talks about the latest science and, you know, has research that's conducted there at the facility. I don't think anybody's doing any research there. It's not that kind of a museum, you know? This is, which is uh, really, really cool. There's a lot of important work being done at the Carter County Museum. 
including field work. There's a crew that's actually digging up a mosasaur uh, just a little ways away right now. Speaking of mosasaurs, I'll show you this one in just a minute or two here. Um, we'll get up close and personal with that. But before I do, let's check out some pachycephalosaurs. Um, and here we go. Everybody loves pachycephalosaurs. We've talked a lot about them on this channel in terms of their ontogeny, and this is what this display is all about. Um, and that's, that's the idea. Yeah. That's actually clear. We, we tried this in clear resin two years ago. So Pachycephalosaurus is an interesting case. It's kind of typical, actually, for a lot of Hell Creek dinosaurs, where the more we learn about them and the more specimens that we have, the more it becomes clear that... A lot of these things we used to think were different species or even different genera turn out to be the same creature at different stages of growth. And so, here we have <laughs> juvenile, see how it says Draco Rex ontogymorph? Yeah. Um, this used to be a different dinosaur genus. Didn't used to be, I mean, it used to be considered a different dinosaur genus. Uh, Bacher described this back in, I don't know when it was. Robert Bacher named it in probably the late 90s or early 2000s. Um, they actually held like a naming contest at the, I think it was at the Indianapolis Children's Museum. So said, what should we name this new dinosaur? And the winning entry was Draco Rex Hogwartsia. It's indeed a, it's a Harry Potter reference, right? I think it is. Showing my pop cultural ignorance again. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and Sunday for dinner. Now these are casts right here, but there is actually a real specimen right there that I'll show you. Um, and another one right here. But anyway, yeah. Uh, so this turns out to just be a juvenile Pachycephalosaurus. See how it's got that kind of flat head with all those ridges and bumps? Little osteoderms on there. This is what it looks like when mature. Um, and it's kind of funny, you'll see a lot of reconstructions of Pachycephalosaurus in a lot of popular dinosaur books, especially from like the 80s and 90s. They're just taking this skull and, uh, I don't know, we didn't really have a whole lot of information about what, what the rest of the animal looked like back in the day. Um, so this skull was really like the whole basis for Pachycephalosaurus. This one here is a cast. The original, I think, is a, it's probably at AM and H in New York. The important thing to know is that this specimen, like the original one that this cast is based on, was found right here in Carter County. So Carter County is, I don't know, you can think of it as like, you know, the hometown of Pachycephalosaurus in a certain sense. Um, yeah, we've learned a lot about these animals in the time since then. And, uh, hear rumors that the Canadians actually have like a full skeleton of Pachycephalosaurus. It might be changing our perception of this animal a lot once that uh, finally gets published. Um, but yeah, before I show you those, the rest of those fossils, let me get some water real quick. I'm pretty thirsty. <laughs> Hang on just a minute. I'm gonna bend down so I don't knock anything over with the antenna. There we go. <sighs> Alright, let's take a look at some of these bits and pieces of juvenile Pachycephalosaurus. Um, here. There we go. So this is spike array probably from well I don't know where that would be on that skull maybe from like the rear rear part toward the bottom anyway it's a nice accumulation of uh, spikes there so that is not a cast you're looking at a genuine pachycephalosaurus spike array right there this one up here is a cast it's a little bit larger from a larger individual um, is this the one that Jack Wilson found? It might be. 
but he found I'm pretty sure that is yeah yeah this is what we would call like the Stygi Moloch on Todrimorph from the like medium size Pachycephalosaurus not fully mature yet but getting bigger than, than the Draco Rex on Todrimorph and right here this is the most commonly found element of Pachycephalosaurus most of the specimens that we have of Pachys are this, just a dome. It seems to be the most resilient part of the animal. And, uh, you know, I've actually... Did I find one of these? No, I think Denver found it back in 2012. We worked a site called uh, Captain Knucklehead. That was the name that he came up for it. He came up, uh, came up with for it, Captain Knucklehead. But, uh, yeah, it was a much bigger dome than this. It was, like, maybe approaching classic, like, holotype pachycephalosaurus skull in terms of size. But, yeah. If you're ever walking through the uh, Hell Creek Formation and you see something that looks like this, chances are it's probably a rock, but it could be uh, a pachy dome. The dome of uh, pachycephalosaurus, just like that. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, oh, and Claire wants to know, do we have any idea why the head would puff up like that as it matured? That's a great question, Claire. Um, it's probably just something to kind of show maturity. For whatever reason, we're not really sure why yet, but it seems really important for these animals to be able to, to tell who is young and who is old. Like, being able to show off how mature you are. Seems to have been a really big deal to these dinosaurs. Maybe that has something to do with social structure or niche partitioning. Maybe they're living in different environments and, you know, they would form social groups with other members of their same kind of growth stage. Kind of like in high school if you have all the, you know, juniors hanging out together and all the seniors hanging out together. Maybe it's the same way with dinosaurs. The why questions are usually some of the most difficult in the sciences. But, uh, yeah, we're really starting to figure out the what and the how. The why is still a little bit tricky. So, great question, Claire. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Hell Creek sounds scary, says DFW. <laughs> uh, in display, exactly, Claire. I know that's become a cliche on this channel, but there you have it. Display was really important to dinosaurs. Um... Let's check out some Mosasaur bits before I show you the full-size Mosasaur behind me. Um, but this is pretty cool. We've got some genuine fossils from right here in Montana. Some of them from Fallon County, some of them from Carter County. Actually, all of these might be from Fallon County. But, uh, yeah, pretty cool. I don't know why they have a plesiosaur there. That's a short-necked plesiosaur. That's not a Mosasaur. It's a little bit confusing. Um, this cre creature is like totally unrelated to mosasaurs. Mosasaurs are kind of lizard. These guys are something else. They're related to like elasmosaurs and other plesiosaurs. Um, we've got some ammonite pieces right there. Very cool. And then some mosasaur bits. Um, the Montana Learning Center apparently helped Carter County Museum dig up a mosasaur few years back. Oh, this is the, just last year. Pretty cool. Yeah. Very neat. So this is some of the local work that's going on here. Uh, pretty neat. And there's some verts. Those look like probably caudal verts. Tail vertebrae. This mosasaur. Uh, pretty neat. From the Pierre Shale. So right before Hell Creek times, right before you had dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops walking around, uh, there was this, you know, seaway that uh, that ran through the middle of what we now call the United States, um, and it kind of ebbed and flowed. It expanded and retreated at various times, but uh, just before Hell Creek times, I think it was kind of at its zenith. This shallow sea covered much of North America, and that's where you have like mosasaurs swimming around, and that's why we find these. Like, if you look in rocks just below the Hell Creek Formation, you will find the Bear Paw Shale, you'll find the Pierre Shale, um, you'll find this stuff, including mosasaurs like this. This one is a sculpt, um, 
and it's funny I was talking to Nate about this yesterday and he said that uh, you know they want they made this Mosasaur a few years ago because they really wanted to have a Mosasaur in the museum these are creatures that uh, that we have here in Carter County and they wanted a good example for the museum and so yeah they put it together they didn't really have a specimen to cast or anything so I think this is it might be entirely a sculpt it's a pretty good one but uh, <laughs> now they're actually digging one up so I'm sure there will be much more Mosasaur material here in the museum in the near future something I'll watch out for it's going to be really cool anyway these guys got pretty big this is approaching maximum size I think for a Mosasaur if you saw the uh, Jurassic World movie there's a Moses that features pretty prominently in that, but that animal is way too big. It's like 200 feet long. This is about as big as they get. You know, close to about 40 feet. Um, you know, like 13, maybe 14 meters. Uh, yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. And Linnaeus says Moses were pretty abundant, weren't they? They were, yeah. Yeah, uh, we have quite a few of them from places like Montana, from places like Kansas, and from places like California, too. This is one of those few, like, Mesozoic vertebrate fossils that we have a few of in California, which is pretty neat. Uh, yeah, anyway. But yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go check out Edmontosaurus. And we'll see if they call it Edmontosaurus here or if they call it something different. Because I figure they very well might. This is kind of the most iconic specimen from the Carter County Museum. Uh, this is a cast, but it used to be called Anatotitan. The name means giant duck. And I'll give you one guess as to why. But yeah, we now know, at least we're pretty, sh pretty sure, I don't know if it's been published on yet, but most of the paleontologists I've talked to who work on Hell Creek stuff also, they say that this is the same animal as Edmontosaurus. This is basically the full-grown ontogomorph of Edmontosaurus, the big duck-billed dinosaur. And Edmontosaurus is pretty special because... I don't know. When you think of the Hell Creek Formation, you think of a lot of big dinosaurs. Almost every dinosaur in that formation is the biggest of its kind. Tyrannosaurus is the largest of the Tyrannosaurs. Triceratops is probably the largest of the Ceratopsians. Um, same with, like, you know, Thescalosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus. Uh, a bunch of these are the largest members of their groups just here at the very end of the Cretaceous period. Same for Edmontosaurus, but Edmontosaurus, even more special than that, it's actually the, the largest dinosaur in the Hell Creek Formation. They get bigger than T-Rex. A lot of people don't realize that, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and these are the second most abundant large dinosaur in the Hell Creek. There's a cool paper by Jack Horner and some other researchers from, um, sometime in like the mid 2000s but they did uh, kind of a survey of Hell Creek dinosaurs during the Hell Creek project and they found that the first most common dinosaur well actually no let me let me have you guess what are the three most common dinosaurs in the Hell Creek uh, and number them for me put them in order if you can um, and while you're doing that I'll uh Kind of give you a nice little visual tour of the skeleton. Uh, this is a plastic cast. Um, a little bit worse for wear. There's some bits flaking off, some of the paint that's coming off there. This thing has been here, I think, I don't know. This display is probably like 70 years old. I'll have to ask exactly how long it's uh, it's been here. But, uh, yeah, and uh, oh, and Lenina, you are exactly right. Yeah, first most common is Triceratops in the Hell Creek. Uh, K 
can't swing in cat without hitting a triceratops in the Hell Creek formation. Trikes are everywhere. Second most common is this guy, Edmontosaurus. And oddly enough, Tyrannosaurus is number three. Like this big apex predator, number three most common in this environment, which is really strange. Um, usually carnivores are pretty rare in their environments. So yeah, it might just be that there weren't that many big predators. Tyrannosaurus is basically like, you know, it's filling all of the big carnivore niches. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. It could also be that the Hell Creek is biased more toward large things being preserved. I don't know. I would need to go back and look at the methodology in that paper to see if they include microsite specimens and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, anyway. At any rate, things get really big in the Hell Creek. Um, if you've ever dug up a Triceratops, you know how difficult that can be. I mean, I talk about how sauropods are a pain in the butt to excavate, but Triceratops is a Ceratopsian that's like almost sauropod size. It's nuts! Uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Dark Fury Reaper, welcome to Paleontologizing, says, could there possibly be just a massive amount of food supply that there was that many? Apparently, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is that dinosaurs do seem to be, like they are in a lot of environments, really abundant in the Hell Creek. And uh, yeah, it could just be that species diversity was very low during the Maastrichtian, uh, at the very end of the Cretaceous period. So like dinosaurs seem to be really abundant. And uh, a lot of them are, I don't know, they because some of them get so big, they uh, they kind of occupy different niches as they as they mature. Like at each growth stage, they're kind of doing a different job. And where in a lot of other environments, especially today with mammals, it's like you know each different animal has its own little niche. And the Hell Creek Formation, and maybe in a lot of other dinosaur bearing formations too. A lot of these environments where dinosaurs lived, they uh, like one dinosaur species could occupy multiple niches during its lifespan. It's kind of just hogging all of these jobs. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Very different from modern environments. Just ecologically, it seems to be not like the sort of thing we see today. Uh, which is pretty cool, if you ask me. There's a lot of ongoing work on this sort of thing right now, but the more work that comes out, the more things that get published, the more robust this conclusion seems to be. Yeah, behind me, of course, we've got Triceratops. Um, this is a lovely Triceratops prorsis. So this is the Triceratops from the top part of the Hell Creek Formation. Um, yeah. So Triceratops, not only do they change a lot as they grow and develop, like you can see there's a baby trike skull right there. That's the same specimen that I have back at uh, back in my office. The front of the face looks a lot different because the front of the face is sculpted, and this artist did a little bit did that a little bit differently. I think this is Mike Trebold's interpretation of this baby trike. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. Obviously, they change a lot as they grow and, and mature. But Triceratops is also evolving over the two million years of the Hell Creek. And uh, this one here has got a pretty decent sized nose horn, right there. And the brow horns are still pretty long. So this is probably not from the very top of the Hell Creek. Um, I wonder if they have good strat data on this, if they can place it in section. So we know exactly, you know, how long ago it was buried. And uh, yeah, if I run into John Scanella, maybe I'll ask him, but yeah. And there's some Triceratops elements right there. We've got a femur and a juvenile femur. An adult humerus, juvenile humerus. Very cool. And then, yeah, growing old and growing big. There you go. Uh, Triceratops. And of course this, a dinosaur formerly known as Taurosaurus. Still known as Taurosaurus to many members of the public and a few researchers too.
but I don't know. I think with some new papers that are going to be coming out in the, hopefully in the near future, we'll put the last nail in the Taurosaurus coffin. Um, but we'll see. Anyway, and the way that we can figure that out, who is old and who is young, is through something we call histology. So I know we talked a lot about it about that on this channel and you'll hear a lot of it in the future um, yeah. mm -hmm. oh pretty cool oh so they're still calling this an Atta Titan in this exhibit very interesting I think there's slim chance that that's actually a valid genus but you know what who do you um, pretty neat Oh, oh, and I was talking a little bit about skin impressions recently. This is a beautiful example of that. So this looks like a resin cast right here. But look at that pebbly texture. Um, this is what hadrosaur skin is textured like. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Those are hadrosaur teeth. Um, they've got this really neat dental battery. I know I've talked about that a bit, but let me rehash it real quick for you. These animals actually chewed their food. Most dinosaurs don't. It's a fairly derived characteristic. But you can see they've got all of those teeth in there. And uh, these guys actually hold the record for the most teeth of any dinosaur, up to like a thousand or something like that. But who's counting? Uh, but the teeth form kind of a continuous cutting, grinding surface. Um, this is the lingual side of the jaw right there, so the tongue would be right here. Um, but as the teeth on the upper jaw and the bottom jaw come together, that cutting surface up there, the teeth kind of come into contact and they grind past one another. Rather than just kind of going like this, um, the teeth kind of slide past each other, almost like a pair of scissors or something like that. There's not really any modern animal that we know of, that I know of at least, that chews that way. So it's... Uh, it's pretty interesting, yeah. Seems to have been a very efficient way of processing food, because hadrosaurs, these dinosaurs, were immensely successful in uh, the late Cretaceous period. Kind of take over the world. So, uh, clearly they were doing something right. And there we've got some ossified tendons right there. I think, let's see, we won't be able to see that on the tail of the mounted skeleton. But these right here are actually bits of tendon or maybe they're ligaments. Ossified tendon might be a misnomer. But basically, these are ligaments or tendons that over the course of the animal's life, they ossify, they turn to bone. Which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, someone is counting? I guess, Gary. <laughs> uh, oh, let's look at some ammonites over here. Pretty neat. This is lovely. So there's a Placentaceras, the genus of ammonite, with the uh, fleshy part filled in in the back. Uh, through some artwork. Pretty neat. Um, I don't really know a lot about these animals, especially their internal anatomy. That's a really cool diagram. I've never seen one of those before. Um, yeah, and there is a modern nautilus. These guys are, they're not super closely related to ammonites actually, the chambered nautilus. I think they're actually closer to octopuses than they are to ammonites. And that might be one of the reasons why they actually survived the extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous, when the ammonites all died out. The asteroid impact really seems to have done a number on these critters. Because, um, yeah, they're just gone. Just like the non-avian dinosaurs, just like the pterosaurs, just like a lot of other species. About 60% of life on Earth, 60% 60, 60 of species, at least, die out during this extinction. Ammonites are one of those. There's another member of the same genus, Placentaceras, right there. Yeah. Uh, pretty cool. And then there's a beautiful diagram. Uh... Showing time throughout here and the different critters that were swimming around during those times. Very neat. Very, very neat. And of course, they go right up until the end of the Mastrichtian, 66 million years ago. And then they're gone. It's just no trace. Extinct. Um, I like.
like that. Ammonites can range from the size of your fingernail to almost 10 feet in diameter. That's over three meters for uh, any of our non-American viewers. Pretty big, pretty big. And then we've got an elasmosaur skull right there. Very cool. We saw one of these yesterday at the museum in uh, Rapid City. I like this one a lot more though. Uh, that's a sculpt. So it's not a cast. It doesn't have the nice fossil texture on there, but it gives you a sense for just how uh, impressive those teeth are. Just like a basket of sharp teeth. Uh, and I, I still don't really know what these guys were doing with those teeth. Are they catching fishes or squids? Are they sifting through sediment on the seafloor? I don't know what they were doing. And I think the jury might still be out on that. I don't know enough about elasmosaurus, but uh, pretty cool stuff. And then, uh, <laughs> ah, one day in 2016, local rancher and Carter County Geological Society board president Lane Carroll. That's Nate's dad, actually. Nate Carroll is the uh, curator here at the museum. Lane is his father. He was searching for a bull at a pasture and stumbled upon some odd-looking rocks. These rocks were fist-sized cobblestones in a marine shale, which Lane knew didn't belong. After exploring further, he noticed bone fragments, which prompted him to contact CCM curator Nate Carroll. <laughs> he calls up his boy Nate. Uh, about the find, the large, smooth rocks turn out to be gastroliths or stomach stones, and the bones belong to a long-necked marine reptile called a plesiosaur. Lane decided to call it Pinto after the horse he was riding when he discovered the skeleton. Pretty cool. Yeah. There's the excavation right there. Got some really nice, uh, probably cervical verts. Seems like most of the verts for, uh, for these guys are cervical verts, neck vertebrae. And uh, there's a crew digging it up. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. Yeah. And there is one of the ribs. Very cool. You can see the cradle that's been built around it in order to help support it. Ribs are notoriously difficult to kind of keep in one piece when they're on display. So you often get cradles like this. Um, I've always liked that word, cradle. It kind of implies uh, you know, caring for these fossils like you might for a baby or something. Uh, yeah. Pretty neat. And then we've got, oh, this is weird and cool. The humerus, the upper arm bone of an elasmosaur right there. Look how short and squat it is. That's the upper arm bone. That's your funny bone, I guess. Uh, the humerus. Um, same bone right there. Uh, this is an animal, I don't know how big it would be, but it's certainly bigger than me. And look how small its humerus is. I mean, pretty cool. Pretty cool. And here, we'll take a look at a few more of these really pretty ammonites before we move on. But take a look at those. Yeah. Gary asked, do you ever feel weird when handling fossils? What do you mean, Gary? I mean, no, I'm, I'm at home when I'm handling fossils. That's, that's part of what I do. Um, there is, I don't know if weird is the right word, but there is a certain kind of reverie that comes with, with handling fossils sometimes. These are the remains of ancient living things millions and millions of years before. So when you hold something like that, I think, I kind of get the same feeling that like, I think that a lot of people get when they look up at the stars. You know, you realize when you're looking up at the stars how very small you are and how, you know, the universe is so vast. And there's a real like, kind of enraptured wonderment that comes with that. I get the same feeling, you know, when I hold a Triceratops bone or something. Like you're holding the, the remains of a creature far larger than yourself, so much older than yourself, you know, 67 million years old. You think about how short your life has been up until that point. And I don't know, it's that same wonderful feeling of smallness. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah. Let's see. Here, I'll show you something kind of funny over here. Uh, not necessarily like fossil related, but I think you'll like it. Um, 
You're welcome, Gary. Thank you for the good question. <laughs> this wouldn't be like a, you know, rural museum in an agricultural area if they didn't have a uh, two-headed calf, two-headed baby cow on display. And uh, there's that one right there. Um, I think this creature was stillborn. Uh, they posed it standing up with its eyes open and everything, but yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully that isn't like too morbid or anything. I think it's fascinating. Uh, basically like cow conjoined twins right there. Yeah. Yeah, we've got some other critters in here. It's a pronghorn. These guys are sometimes called antelope. Or local Montanans sometimes call them speed goats. They are neither antelope nor goats. Those guys, pronghorns, are actually the last living representatives of a group called the Antilocaprids. Um, they used to be far more diverse. There were many different species of them with all kinds of weird horns and headgear. There's one called Synthetoceros, where it's got one, like, curved horn basically above each eye, and then on its nose it's got this super long horn with a fork at the top, kind of like a big letter Y sticking up out of its nose. Uh, but in terms of their body shape, they're very similar to, uh, to pronghorns. These guys are still around today. They're the fastest mammal in North America. And they're the last members of Antila Capridae. They're the last members of that group still surviving. And they are super fast. They can run at like 40 miles an hour. Uh, and we think that they actually evolved that speed not to outrun any animal that's alive today. Nothing else can approach them in terms of speed like that. They seem to have evolved to outrun the American cheetah, which is pretty cool. Um, we used to have cheetahs here in North America up until pretty recently, just like a few thousand years ago, um, during the Pleistocene. I don't know if they're related to modern cheetahs in Africa. They're some kind of very fast, very lithe cat, big cat. They might be more closely related to pumas, cougars, and mountain lions than to cheetahs. I don't know, you should check Wikipedia. Somebody check real quick. Tell me what the latest consensus is on the American cheetah and whether it's actually a cheetah or whether it's something else. But yeah. Um, yeah. And Dark Raven, yeah, I think it is Miocene or Pliocene, Synthetoceros. They're pretty cool. They're pretty cool. Certainly before the Pleistocene, I think. Um, yeah. This is pretty neat. We're on the back of the Pachycephalus or display right now. And this is cool because we actually have an endocast of its brain. So that is what a Pachycephalus or brain looks like. You can actually see the uh, like semicircular canal inner ear right there, associated with balance. That's got to be the olfactory bulb at the front, I would assume. And then optic nerve is somewhere in there, too. Pretty cool. I get so many questions about dinosaur brains and dinosaur intelligence on this channel that I wanted to make sure that I point that out. You're looking at a pachycephalosaur brain right there. Pretty nifty. Yeah, I'll show you a view from above as well, so you can see that semicircular canal, the inner ear. Cool stuff. And as you can see, it's not... These animals have a big bulbous head. Not a lot of that's taken up by brain. This is all solid bone in there. I say solid, but it was actually pretty spongy. And, uh, oh, this display talks about that. Yeah. Um, it says, note the cross-section of the Pachycephalosaurus dome. It is solid bone straight to the brain cavity. Um... Oh, it doesn't talk about... It is pretty porous, though. Or not... Not porous, but it's not, like, particularly consolidated or strong. It seems that these... The skull just inflated really, really quickly um, as the animal matured. Cool stuff. Oh, and we've talked a little bit about ankylosaur tail clubs on this channel before. They don't have a actual tail club like fossil or cast here but what they do have is this big silhouette that shows you the size of one of these guys clubs uh, pretty neat that is big um, so it would have looked like this but this is what I'm talking about right here that is pretty large right yeah. 
Um, yeah. Uh, and you spelled Pachycephalosaurus right, Gary. Yeah. They are super cool. They're really fascinating animals. My friend Kerry Woodruff is actually working on them right now for his uh, PhD. Oh, and here we've got a lovely original painting of some Pachys right there. Very cool. From the Carter County Museum Artist in Revenant, Residence from 2017. Really neat. Acrylic painting. Um, and rather than headbutting, these guys are basically just wrestling, kind of like uh, the iguanas might do. Pretty neat. Um, oh, and I didn't even see this earlier. <laughs> of course, the, that 3D printer over there has been chugging away. Um, printing the same juvenile Tyrannosaurus that I have at home in my office. So, yeah, it's so cool to see this in an actual museum, too. Um, this is uh, that same 3D printed model. Pretty neat. It's funny, it looks smaller here than uh, the one I have at home. I don't know, it must just be that... Uh, <laughs> I don't know, there's so many other big fossils around here. You know, I think of it as being small when it's not. Yeah, it's small by comparison. Is that a mammoth tusk by me? Oh, it is, Izzy. Let me show you real quick. Of course, that's just like me to walk past a mammal fossil. Um, yeah, take a look at that. Not only do we have, we've got a bunch of mammoth uh, elements over here. This is the inside of a skull. This is one of the tusks going up like that. This is like the animal's palate. It's probably the vomer bone right there. And then, man, mammals have such weird skulls. You know, like, I'm used to dinosaur skulls where they're, you know, they're kind of built like, like a really well-designed bridge or something like that. You know, they've got support struts and stuff and then there's just a bunch of empty space in there for air sacs and hollows and that kind of thing. With mammals, it's just like a honeycomb on the inside. Um, it still ends up being a lot bulkier than dinosaur skulls. And more massive, but yeah, it's got that honeycomb texture. Just, I don't know. Saying this as a mammal, I think that's weird. Um, and then, wait, who's this right here? <laughs> We've got a wolf. Uh, the Hammond wolf, the display said. Um, that's pretty cool. Basically just a big primitive dog. Um, yeah. Oh, it was shot really recently. It's actually really quite distressing. But anyway, yeah. All these mammoth elements right here. Pretty cool stuff. Look at these teeth. So mammoth teeth are super distinctive. If you've ever wondered how to tell the difference between a mammoth and a mastodon, the teeth are a dead giveaway. Mastodon teeth look a lot like human molars. They've got these big, you know, ridges and cusps on them. Mammoth teeth are pretty flat. So right here, you're actually seeing like the grinding surface of the tooth. That's the root back there. They kind of have these lines that go back and forth like this. I think they're pretty similar to elephant teeth, like modern elephants, like the Asian elephant and African elephant. Yeah. Cool stuff. And there's some sort of big limb bone. Sort of, of course, yeah. Probably a radius. No, that's probably an ulna, actually. It's got the big leopardin process. Oh, yeah. Check out that tusk. This has been in the museum here since forever. You can tell because it has a metal rod running through it. This is the actual fossil bone. Back in the day, they would actually ram metal rods through them to act as supports. Don't do that sort of thing nowadays. It's a pretty, pretty antique specimen there. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and there's another one right there. Pretty neat. Um, yeah, and here's some more Pleistocene fossils. There's a jaw of a mammoth right there. You can see the new tooth that's kind of being pushed forward. Pretty neat stuff. Smilodon skull. Just like I've got at home. And then some other mammals as well. This is cool. History of horses. So take a look at this. That is your modern, like, one-toed horse. 
But horses used to have three toes on each foot. You can kind of see that right there. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, neat stuff. Um, so yeah, yeah. Let's see if there's anything else to show you. This is visited most of the things in the main hall here. I didn't show you the big Mosasaur skull over there. Let me show you that. Introduce you to a Tylosaurus skull up close and personal. Yeah. Um, again, this is above our Elasmosaurus skull. Take a look at that. Tylosaurus. This is one of the biggest of the Mosasaurus. Check out those teeth. And can you see the second row of teeth in there? The, uh, what are they called? Palatine teeth, or... I forget, but they're on the roof of the mouth. Do you see them in there? Look under the eye socket. Same mailman. Pretty cool, right? I'll give you another look. Pretty awesome. Yeah. And these guys, of course, are... Lizards. So there's a modern varanid lizard. Uh, those little orange dots right there are showing you some of the points of kinesis, like the joints in the skull. The skull can actually flex. Those are sources that have something very similar. I don't know if the, uh, the like, second row of teeth, the, like, roof of the mouth teeth, I don't know if those were mobile like they are in snakes. I don't know if we know that about them, know whether or not they were. But, uh, pretty cool, yeah. Um, but yeah, and Javasaurus, yes, yeah, their Mosasaur was okay in Jurassic World. It was, I don't know, it had completely the wrong skin on it. It had like crocodile scutes all over it, which these guys certainly did not have. They're lizards, they're not crocodiles. So, uh, yeah. By the way, Mosasaurs like that obviously are not a dinosaur. They're a kind of giant marine lizard, which is uh, still pretty cool. And we've got over here an ichthyosaur. Take a look at this. Pretty neat. Is it okay if I gave you this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, pretty awesome. We've talked a little bit about ichthyosaurs. And I think this is the original specimen. You can see this is a very old display. <laughs> the upper lias. That's so funny. So yeah, from the upper Jurassic period, this might be. Um, it's not Temnodontosaurus. So no, I don't think it's. It could be either Ichthyosaurus or Stenopterygius. Um, but yeah, here's its skull right here. I think we're looking at it from the top down. It could also be from the bottom up. Um, looks like from the bottom up. Yeah. I think these are either side of the lower jaw right there. And this is one of these marvelous flippers. These guys actually have the same bones that we have in our hands, and they're flippers, but in them they've evolved to be, basically they're, they're all flattened out. It's this nice little mosaic pattern of little hockey puck bones, mosaic tile bones. Very cool, it formed the flippers. There's another one, and you've got this basket of ribs all tangled up right here. Very cool. You can see some of the vertebral centra. Um, and then all the way down the tail, there's the rear flippers right there. And then over here, got this nice kink in the tail right there. So that forms the tail fluke. So we talked about this a little bit before. But uh, these just only have bones in the lower fork, like the lower part of the tail fluke. The top part of the tail fluke has just been soft tissue, just muscle and skin and probably some tendon in there. Maybe some cartilage, too. Um, I don't know. I don't work on ichthyosaurs. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. Very, very cool. So when these guys were first found, you know, we only really had skeletons of them. Uh, so we didn't really have, like, any soft tissue preserved at all. It's just bone. And so some of the earliest ichthyosaur reconstructions just show them with this long, kind of snaky tail. But now we know they actually had a big fluke on their tail, a lot like a swordfish or something like that. Or kind of like a dolphin's tail, but sideways. These guys would skull their tails horizontally from side to side in order to propel themselves forward. Unlike a dolphin that goes up and down like that. These guys evolved from land-living reptiles. 
And so most reptiles, their spines flex from side to side. Think about how a lizard or a crocodile walks. You know, they're not going up and down like this. They're going from side to side. And so when ichthyosaurs, when the an their ancestors took to the seas, you know, they obviously used that same method, side to side motion of the spine. Um, and eventually they became so well adapted to life in the sea that they couldn't even come up on the land. They didn't have functional limbs for, living on, for walking around on land. Rather than laying eggs on the beach, they would actually give birth to live young. Uh, we found ichthyosaur specimens with like a fetus inside. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool just how marvelously well adapted they were to life in the seas. And they range in size from, you know, like less than a meter long, to something like this, to a creature like the size of a bus. There's even some hints of even larger ichthyosaurs from England. I think Dean Lomax uh, published on this a while ago, but you know, like a potentially like 30 meter long ichthyosaur. So a creature like approaching blue whale size. Just incredible. Um, so yeah, it could very well be that the largest animal that's ever lived might not be a blue whale. It could be an ichthyosaur. Who knows? I mean, time will tell. It could also be that the proportions were all wonky on that one and it just had a really big, really big skull, a smaller rest of the body, but... I don't know. But a critter that big, what would it even eat? How would an animal that size sustain itself? I mean, blue whales obviously eat, you know, zooplankton, krill, and that kind of thing. What would an ichthyosaur that size eat if it were 90 feet long, if it were the size of a blue whale? Do they eat squids? I don't know. They don't seem to be filter feeders, any ichthyosaurs, so... I don't know. I really don't know. Um... But yeah. And uh, obviously says, can you check your encoder temperature real quick? That's a great idea. Let me do that. It is mounted over here. And... Feels fine. Yeah. Yeah. This, on the other hand, is really heating up. <laughs> My uh, signal booster, that thing generates a lot of heat. You can see the... Uh, it's red hot right now. I'm just kidding, it's painted red. But uh, it's got all those fins on it to help radiate heat. Wow, this is really nice. Everybody cleared out. <laughs> Here, I'm gonna set the camera down for just a minute and I'm gonna get some water. And then maybe we'll take a few more looks at that Tyrannosaurus specimen. But hang tight, everybody. Just a minute here. All right, I gotta uh, go like this. There we go. I've been told that this drinking fountain right here actually has the most pal palatable water in town. Um, like in a lot of uh, rural Montana towns, especially in the eastern part of the state, um, the water here has kind of a mineral taste to it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's not nearly as bad as in, like, Jordan, Montana. But, you know, still, I'm from the Bay Area. I'm used to like obnoxiously good tasting water. <laughs> it's kind of stupid how, how good our water is in places like San Francisco and Oakland. Oh, we missed this earlier. Take a look at this. This beautiful painting right here. Of a Tyrannosaurus just ripping the head off a of Triceratops. <laughs> um, this is based on actual research. Um, yeah, I wonder when Denver's finally gonna publish that, is how to eat a Triceratops paper. Um, but yeah, yeah, by looking at bite marks on Triceratops fossils, we can gain some kind of a clue as to, uh, you know, how these animals would have dismantled the carcass. And it's not just like looking at one or two fossils here, it's like a survey of, I don't know how many dozens of specimens all showing the same pattern. It's pretty cool, that kind of work. Um, oh, we've got this right here. We'll take a look at the, uh, the bird origins display. Talking about theropod dinosaurs and them giving rise to birds. Um, yeah. What are birds? Birds are the descendant of theropod meat-eating dinosaurs. Now, how many times have I told you that? <laughs> and this channel over the over uh, the past year and a bit. Um, yeah. 
Uh, oh, and cool. Oh, okay, this is not the only one in the world, but it says Y-Rex is one of two T-Rexes in the world to be mounted in a brooding posture. Birds will brood like this over their nest to protect their eggs and keep them warm. Um, it says compare this to the meadowlark. Do they look the same? There's a meadowlark skeleton right there. It's just a little theropod dinosaur. Uh, and there we've got a maxilla of Jane, the Tyrannosaurus, um, which is that same one. That's Jane right there. This is her maxilla. Pretty cool. Uh, oh, they've got a, I've never seen this before anywhere. Wow. A cast of a Cararaptor, or maybe Asheroraptor. It's named after the river Asheron in uh, Greek mythology. Um, Greek mythology or Roman mythology? I always get this mixed up. One of them is the river Styx, and one of them is the river Asheron, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, that's one of the dromaeosaurs from the Hell Creek Formation. That's almost certainly the same animal as Dakota Raptor. Um, at least, I don't know. Time will tell, obviously. But yeah. Uh, but check that out. Maxilla of a dromaeosaur, a tyrannosaur, and then, uh, pretty neat. This display is talking about the similarities between uh, the feet of dinosaurs and birds. It's got a great big pedal phalanx right there. Uh, that's what, the middle toe, I think? Digit two or digit three? It's probably digit three. It's not really squashed in either direction. And that's probably from the left foot, I would think, because it's slightly skewed that way. Oh, the display shows us, yeah. <laughs> I don't even have to guess. Um, but yeah, look how robust that is. Um, this is a big, massive animal. And uh, that's how big its toe bone is. Compare that to like your toe bones. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Um, and very similar to modern birds. There's another ground running bird from today, a turkey. We got the uh, metatarsals, I guess the tarso metatarsus. And the pedal digits and the pedal unguals, and toe bones and the claws. Yeah. Oh, and here, oh man, I was talking about how I wish this was in the mounted Y Rex specimen, but here it is on display. That is the furcula, the wishbone of a T Rex. Pretty cool. Compare that to the wishbone of a turkey right here. Um, it's a little bit bigger. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it was only like 2004. It was first published on that dinosaurs like this had furculae. They had wishbones. I remember the paper, it talks about a Tyrannosaurus furcula and a Suchomimus furcula, which is really interesting. Big Spinosaur theropod. Um, yeah. And there is a, ah, a nice painting of Archaeopteryx right there. Man, we gotta get a we gotta get an Archaeopteryx cast or an Archaeopteryx 3D. They should 3D print an Archaeopteryx for uh, for this museum. That would be cool to have. I mean, shoot, if I have one, they should have one here. Uh, yeah. Oh, and this is neat too. I know I've shown this figure before on this channel, but check that out. Um, this is from a I think 2006 or 2007 paper. Um, that's a Velociraptor, Olna, right there, uh, showing the quill knobs, just like on, say, a turkey vulture or, or something like that. Um, you know, demonstrating once and for all that Velociraptor had feathers. Um, we knew for a while that it probably did, because a lot of its relatives from, uh, from Liaoning, the Yixian Formation in China, some other dromaeosaurs had preserved feathers. Um, like the specimens are that well preserved that you know, like the integument, the feathers are clearly visible in the fossil. So you know, a lot of paleontologists thought Velociraptor probably also had feathers and this is like incontrovertible proof that they did. Um, those quill knobs right there on the ulna. Pretty cool. So yeah, really neat display. And pretty soon they're going to have a complete juvenile Tyrannosaurus presiding over it. Just like I've got at home. Pretty nifty, yeah. Um, 
and uh, there you go, yeah, Dark Raven, this is true. T-Rex has what we call the Arctometatarsalian condition. Let me show you. Where the metatarsals basically get like fused together into like, almost like a single bone, like the cannon bone of a horse. But check that out. I love that I can just show this to you right up close. Yeah, this is the Arctometatarsalian condition where the middle metatarsal, metatarsal uh, three, just gets pinched like that. So this is just like one solid mass of bone right there. Um, pretty neat. And uh, there are other theropod dinosaurs that have this too. Ornithomimosaurs have this, the ostrich dinosaurs. Um, and in them, it's an adaptation for shock absorption, probably. These guys seem to have been really fast runners. And Tyrannosaurus seems to have evolved from the same ancestors that the Ornithomimosaurus had, and so, yeah, yeah. That feature that they inherited probably would have given them a big advantage for, you know, shock absorption when they're moving around. Uh, pretty cool. I love how the, the tail just kind of cuts off right here, too. <laughs> I don't know if they... Uh, I don't know if uh, they just don't have the vertebrae here, or if they more likely just wouldn't fit here in the hall properly. Um, but yeah, yeah. Check out these caudal chevrons right here. These bones that kind of hang down off of the caudal vertebrae. So these would have been attachment points for different muscles in the tail. And uh, so anytime you've got caudal chevrons like that, those are like anchor points for these muscles that ran from there down to the femur. And let's see if we can find the fourth choke center there. There it is. See this bump sticking off the bottom of the femur right there? That is an attachment point uh, for the caudofemoralis muscle. It's a great big muscle that would help swinging the, uh, the femur back and forth while the animal's walking or running. Um, dinosaurs are really interesting in that they, unlike us when we walk, like when I walk, you know, femur swings forward and then backward like that. I hope you could see that. Dinosaurs, it seems, their femurs could swing forward, but they couldn't swing backward past the vertical. Um, they'd go forward like this, and on the backswing, they would stop just like that. And, uh, yeah, it's very different from the way that modern birds walk. I think it has something to do with the dinosaur tail and how the the muscles are linked up to it like that, the way that they're anchored there to the tail. Um, but yeah, yeah, so anytime you see a, a dinosaur in a painting or a movie or a video game or something, when it's like swinging its femur like way far backward like that, uh, they couldn't do that. This is one of those reasons why you need paleontologists to review your stuff if you're gonna put dinosaurs in media. So you make sure that you get that sort of thing right. Because if you don't, it just looks wrong. And like the people who know a thing or two about dinosaurs, uh, yeah, they uh, might not be too happy. All right, oh, and let's look at the, you know what these are right here on the sides of the vertebrae? These are the transverse processes. So just like the caudal chevrons, these are attachment points for those big muscles. Those might be the primary attachment point, actually, for uh, like the caudal femoralis. But anyway, you can just picture this like, big array of ligaments um, and muscles that are, well, I don't know. They might be ligaments, they might be, well, tendons. Let's see, you can tell how long it's been since I've done soft anatomy. But anyway, yeah, big attachment point for the stuff that helps swing the, uh, the leg forward and backward. Pretty cool. Um, and the rest is, so there's always a foot on the ground and no running was possible? Well, no, I mean, when these animals were young, I'm sure they would have been able to run in the sense that, like, they'd have both feet off the ground at the same time. I don't know for a full-size adult if these guys would have actually, like, you know, truly ran, where you've got all the limbs off the ground at the same time. Uh, I don't know, yeah. 
the thing is, when an animal gets this big, it's really massive, but it also has a really long stride. So even just like a fast walk would have been probably like faster than you can run. You as the viewer, I mean. Um, yeah, yeah. And then, I don't know, these animals change so much through ontogeny that it could be that juveniles were like active, fast pursuit predators. And uh, later on, you know, when they became full grown, they would have been a lot slower. Maybe they would have turned into ambush predators. Maybe if they really are super, super large, they wouldn't even have to, to like capture their own prey. Like if a smaller Tyrannosaur made a kill, maybe they could just kind of steal it from them or something. I don't know. We're getting into some really speculative stuff here. But uh, yeah, yeah. So could full grown Tyrannosaurus run? I don't, I'm not gonna pretend like I know. Uh, it's a cool question and there's there's a lot of cool implications if we could figure that out I feel like we'll answer a lot of other important questions about these animals you know um, yeah yeah uh, there are no vertebrates with more than four legs Mayor Space I could show you one Did I show you this earlier? Were you here? <laughs> oh. It was stillborn, apparently. But, uh, yeah. Kind of conjoined cow twins, maybe. But apart from, you know, bizarre mishaps like that, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, can a kangaroo run? I'm not sure limited breadsticks. What do you mean by run? Does hopping count? Oh, this is so cool. I can't believe I overlooked this before. Of course, I'm in Montana right now. I lived in this state for the better part of a decade before moving back to California. Got some symbols of Montana. And right there, <laughs> we've got Meadowlark, which is the state bird of Montana. I think there's like seven other states that have the Meadowlark as their state bird, but no other state has Myasaura as its state fossil. Um, one of my favorite dinosaurs. Oh, and there's a bitter root flower, too. That's the state flower. Pretty cool. Illustration by Doyle Trancana. Pretty neat. You've got two dinosaurs and a flower. <laughs> two dinosaurs and a flower. Yeah. Um, and here's the state dinosaur, Myasaura pubosaurum. So a lot of states have both a state fossil and a state dinosaur. I would have to check to see if Montana's state dinosaur is also its state fossil, or if its state fossil is also its state dinosaur. Like for California, Smilodon is our state fossil, and Augustin Alophis is our state dinosaur. Myasaurus might actually fill both of those roles for the state of Montana. Yeah, and we will be seeing some more Myasaurus stuff uh, at Museum of the Rockies if I'm able to get the on the streaming equipment to work there. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, this has been super cool. Does anybody else have any pressing questions or anything before I go ahead and, go ahead and wrap up this stream? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, take a look at this. Mini mirror up there. Pretty cool. Could we done back in what, the 50s or maybe the 60s? Um, I like how there's a bunch of different dinosaurs from the museum all represented there. We've got uh, Pachycephalosaurus, Ankylosaurus, Anatotitan, uh, Tyrannosaurus. Pretty cool. One of those things that would be really easy to overlook. There's so much else going on here. Um, yeah. Oh, and uh, let me show you this again, because I think some people may have shown up after I was displaying this, or after I was showing this off, this display. But here's a Triceratops denary right there, with some big scour marks on it. It seemed to be from Tyrannosaurus teeth. And, uh, oh, and I was talking about Denver Fowler's research on this. 
Well, here it is. Yeah, a recent study by Denver Fowler and colleagues at Museum of the Rockies has given us a better idea of how exactly the snacking took place. I know I've shown this on the channel several times, but uh, pretty cool. These are patterns that are consistent across dozens of Triceratops fossils. Um, so that's, uh, I don't know, that's some cool science, if you ask me. And then, this is pretty neat. Um, this is somebody wearing a sun helmet while excavating a dinosaur. <laughs> that is one of my, uh, I don't know, pieces of, one of my headgears of choice in the field. Um, I actually brought it with me along this trip. So if I'm going to spend any time outside, any like significant length of time while it's really hot, that's what I'll be wearing. Um, pretty cool. Pretty cool. This is way back in 1938. Wow. <laughs> so it's probably not long after that. that uh... Oh, that's cool. Um, Marshall Lambert who's kind of a legendary figure in the history of this museum, assembled the specimen in the basement of the now-rebuilt Carter County High School. That's really cool. Yeah. Not a Titan. Um, or Edmontosaurus, depending on who you ask. I'm going to call it Edmontosaurus. Um, yeah. And that's exactly right, Dark Raven. Just amazing, the bite force on uh, Tyrannosaurus like that. Pretty cool pretty cool. I mean, it's difficult to like actually calculate that sort of thing and get good numbers on it, but when you can find elements that have clearly been crushed, and it seems like they've been crushed by Tyrannosaur jaws, it's like that gives you at least a broad sense for how powerful a bite these animals have. Uh, even if we can't get exact numbers on it, it's like, it's still pretty cool. And you are looking in the face of an as dark and pterosaur right now, a lot like Quetzalcoatlus. This is a sculpt right here, um, a really skillfully done one, I think. This is really neat. You won't see mounted pterosaur skeletons like this in many places in the world, especially not as dark as. Uh, pretty neat. These guys probably spent the majority of their time on the ground. At least that's what I've heard some pterosaur researchers say in the past. I think Nate has told me that too. Uh, he worked on pterosaurs for a while, and uh, one of his babies there. Very cool. It's got a very small body. His body's like significantly smaller than mine. A rib cage, almost like that of a turkey. But a very big animal. Very big animal. And they got significantly larger than this, too. Um, did I show you this earlier? Take a look at this. That might have been this morning. Um, but take a look at that. I love this artwork. This is one of the Carter County Museum posters. I think you can actually buy this on like Redbubble. So check it out if you really like it. You can get one for your office or your home. Um, but yeah, they got truly large, like maybe a 40 foot wingspan, you know, on the order of like 12 meters. Um, so there's one next to a Cessna. Uh, the first airplane to fly the skies of Eastern Montana was a 30 foot modified World War II World War I training plane in a county fair. Uh, but 66 million years ago, the skies were ruled by pterosaurs with wingspans up to 40 feet, larger than a modern Cessna. That's so cool. I love the art style here. And like those old uh, like National Parks posters, like work, Works Progress Administration kind of art style. Very neat. And uh, there's a lovely Asdarkid painting there. And then this is one of those cool things that you're not gonna, not gonna see in any other museum. This is a cast of an Asdarkid pterosaur cervical vertebra. And that specimen is here at the Carter County Museum. Um, pretty neat, pretty neat. Oh, and maybe you will see it at the Berkeley Museum too. I guess they have a cast of it there. But check this out. That is how big the animal's head is uh, estimated to be based on the size of that cervical vert. Really cool. 
<laughs> These kind of remind me of giraffes in the sense that they've got really, really long cervical vertebrae. They don't have very many of them, but uh, yeah, for whatever reason, it's super important for these guys to evolve really long necks. Maybe they're acting kind of like marabou storks or something like that, where they're kind of walking around on land and just, you know, they spend most of their time on the ground, just eating whatever unfortunate creatures come into their path. Um, and like having the head mounted up way up high like that would have been advantageous for them to be able to keep a lookout. Not just for prey items, but also for predators too. Because um, you know that a you know, Tyrannosaurus, if it got hold of one of these guys. Yeah. Even though they don't have much meat on them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, really cool stuff. This is such a cool museum. I wish you could be here with me. This is, uh, this is pretty special. I gotta figure out what I wanna stream tomorrow. Now that we've seen most of the muse, we've seen pretty much all the museum, the paleo exhibits at least. Um, yeah. I may or may not stream tomorrow. We shall see. It might be a little while till my next stream. But uh, this has been a ton of fun. I'm so glad. Finally got the whole rig working again. Man, I was straight sweating for six hours trying to get this thing up and running. Uh, it's been a stressful day. I'm about ready to unwind. I'm going to go to the bar and see if any paleontologist friends are already there. And uh, i got to eat something, too. I'm getting really hungry. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you're sending, oh, thank you, Soph. Hello, Soph Luff and son. I'm glad you had uh, a great time. And I'm looking forward to being able to show you some more museums pretty soon here. So, as I uh, fiddle with this, um, read stage, that's a great idea, Claire. That's a great idea. Let me open up Twitch and then. Go to chat. There we go. And uh, let's go ahead and raid Rocket Sage. Raid Rocket Sage. There we go. Oh, and Izzy wants to see the complete T Rex skull before we. we have, I could do that for you, Izzy. Yes. There we are. This, of course, is the specimen Y Rex. Pretty cool, right? Pretty cool. Here's the eye socket right here. This is where the eyeball would be, about the size of an orange. It's the intorbital fenestra. This is all like air sacs and hollows in there. There's the nares, the nostril, and then premaxillary and maxillary teeth. Take a look at those. Pretty cool, huh? Post-orbital fenestrae. Yeah. Pretty awesome, I think. All right. Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and raid Rocket Sage, and I will wrap this up. Thank you, everybody, for making this such a great stream. So glad I got this running now. Hopefully, this will be the end of our troubles with this kind of thing. I guess we'll see. Um, but yeah... And Timber, I can't stream the talks. That's a different thing. If you would like to watch the talks, then uh, you can actually buy an online ticket for the Dino Shindig. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's see. Claire, somebody, can you pull up the Shindig uh, command? I think those might be logged for a while so that uh, you can watch them even after the fact. I don't think you have to watch them live. But I'm not entirely sure. But anyway... Um, yeah, thank you, everybody, and uh, you all take care of yourselves, and hopefully I will see you soon. All right, thanks for a great stream, and uh, we'll go ahead and raid Sage in seven, six, five, four. All right, everybody, you take care of yourselves. Thanks for doing some paleontologizing with me, and I'll see you next time.
A real mean kid. With six-inch daggers for teeth, he was the terror of his neighborhood.